I just know you're going to love the guests that we have on in this episode. So don't go away. Welcome to another episode of The Interview. I'm Dr. Rick Wadge, and it's so good to be in your home, on your iPhone, on your mobile devices, whatever you have this week. We have a special guest. We're on a special set as well this week. Our special guest is Dr. Emily Noteboom, and it's so good to have you here in Texas. Thank you so much. It's just a privilege to be here. It's my very first time being in Texas. And so far, I've not been disappointed. Good, good, good. I hope the people are impressing you with their kindness and... Yes, and their uh, hospitality yes. and just yeah. their, their interest. No, I've been very blessed so far. Mm -hmm. And they're interested in what you do and where you're from. So why don't you tell our guests, our, our people that are watching, yes. uh, something about yourself. Well, um, I am from Holland. I live in Amsterdam. Uh, not far from where Anne Frank was um, hiding during the Second World War, and about 20 minutes from where Corey Ten Boom used to live. So mm. that's my little nick of the woods. Um, and I work for an organization that is called the European Coalition for Israel. And we stand for the Jewish people and mm -hmm. the Jewish state in, a, in an environment in Europe that is sadly showing signs of rising anti-Semitism. And so um, that's my job. From um, back from my background, um, I'm actually a lawyer, okay. but um, I've also served in missions for some time. And just recently, I um, finished a PhD on the Judeo-Christian foundations of Western civilization. And where did you uh, where did you study? Um, I studied at the University of Oxford in okay, the UK. I think all of us have heard of Oxford before. <laughs> yes. <so>. yes. <laughs> Yes. Well, that's a, that's amazing. What a background and what a calling. Mm -hmm. Do you consider it a calling? Yes, I am very passionate about this. I think we are living in a very unique time in, your, in history. And um, now is the time for us to be awake and to not be asleep. What's and, uh, unique about this time versus other times in history? Well, I think um, if you look at Europe, um, there is a, a real trend that we are seeing of um, uh, kind of a perfect storm brewing of different influences that make it quite similar to the 1930s. And as, if you look at what is happening to the Jewish people, if you look at how um, the European Union is treating the state of Israel, um, it's just very worrisome signs. And we have always said never again because we as Europeans we have made all the mistakes when it comes to treatment of the Jews. Um, and they go back far, far into the history, not just the Second World War. The Second yes. World War is the one that we all remember. And of course, six million Jews were killed. Um, in my country of the Netherlands, before the war, we had 144,000 Jewish people. Um, just our neighbors and our friends. And after the war, we had only 40,000 left. Oh, my. So, um, so on, at our, on their, under our nose, we had about 78% of the Jewish community in Holland mm -hmm. just senselessly murdered for the only crime of being Jewish. Um, and um, so, so we live with that history and we live with that um, memory. And of course, Anne Frank is very famous. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, she did not survive either. Um, and uh, Corrie ten Boom is famous, and we like to claim Corrie ten Boom because she was one of the brave ones who actually did something for the yes. Jewish people. But to be really honest, most Dutch people did not um, behave very bravely. Most of them kind of kept their head down, tried to just survive. You have to remember that the Nazis were very ruthless. So if they found you were helping people, they would kill, kill you and your family as well, or just the whole street if you happen to mm -hmm. live somewhere. Um, and they wouldn't really care if it was just or not. It's, you know, the, there was a cost to being brave and there was a cost to being uh, doing what was right. Mm -hmm. And uh, to my shame, lots of Dutch people just try to survive and just let the Jews fend for themselves. Some 
um, were collaborators, some actually betrayed Jewish people. We know, of course, the story of Corrie ten Boom, she was betrayed. Um, and then uh, most were kind of indifferent and kept their head down, and then some were really brave, like Corrie ten Boom and some other people. And, um, and actually, for me as a little girl, I've often wondered, you know, if I had been alive at that time, would I have been one of the brave ones? Mm. Would I have been um, someone who would have done what was right? And it's very easy for us to say, oh, of course, we would have been a good one. But war is very complicated and mm. war is hard. And, um, and scary. And if they will torture you and do all kinds of scary things to you, mm -hmm. if they catch you, I mean, it takes a lot of courage to yes. then do something. And willingness to lay down your life. Yeah, and you have to be willing to look in the face that this may not have a happy ending for you. And so I always wondered, you know, it's hard to say, but mm -hmm. would I have been a, a brave one? I don't think I would have been a collaborator, but would I have been some of the, mm -hmm. you know, the more normal ones to just look away and kind of hope they didn't see you and didn't catch you? Or would I have been one of the brave ones? But with the situation in Europe changing slowly but gradually, my old question of would I have been a brave one is now starting to become, am I a brave one? Mm -hmm. Because we are seeing similar situations that we were seeing in the 1930s. And so um, for European believers, it's no longer, you know, what, what would I have done? That's no longer an issue. That's in the past. We cannot change the past. Yes. But the question is, what are we doing today? And there is work for Christians to be doing. And this is where my passion comes in. I can see that. And you are being one of the brave ones because you are standing up for Israel right now. Well, at the moment, yes. What do you think some of the ingredients are that are making this time in 2019, we're dating the program, to a time very similar in the 1930s? Yeah, I know. It sounds a bit funny, doesn't it? It's like, aren't you a bit alarmist? The thing is, um, uh, you have to look at the bigger picture. You cannot just look at small incidents um, because what we are seeing in Europe is that Europe, of course, you have to remember, just like you cannot really say the United States as one block because Texas is going to have different issues than, for instance, Wyoming or California. Sure. It's the same with Europe. Europe is very diverse and mm -hmm. Europe has a different Depending on the countries, you have a different history, you have a different influence, you have different religious influences. The north of Europe is much more Protestant influenced, then the south of Europe is much more Catholic influenced, and then you have the Eastern European, Central European countries, and they've been influenced by Orthodox mm -hmm. Christianity. And then, of course, you have different histories because the West, after the Second World War, the West was liberated by the Allied forces, American, English, and Canadian. And as you know, the Americans came. They paid the highest sacrifice with young guys giving their lives to liberate us from a tyrant. Okay. What did the Americans do? They um, took some land for, to bury their dead, um, and that's it. They left. And actually, American people, in amazing generosity, poured millions and millions of dollars into the rebuilding of Europe through the Marshall Plan. So that is my Western European history. Holland is in Western Europe. So I have been the benefit, like the recipient of all this generosity mm -hmm. and American influence. And I've grown up in a free Western country. Whereas if you go, for instance, to a country like Poland, Poland in this, after the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War, was liberated by the Russians. Mm -hmm. But unlike the Americans, the Russian state and they imposed communism to the Poles. So the Poles went from being um, overrun by the Nazis to being overrun by the Russians. And so their history has become you know, influenced by this and their mentality is influenced by this. Um, and so even though now, of course, the wall has fallen and the Russians are no longer in Poland and they have their sovereignty back and they are growing as free societies and they're part of the European Union project, which also means that there is a, a, a leveling out and an influence from the west to the east and the east to the west. Yes. Um, the, the, you know, the, the DNA of the culture is very different. So you have to remember when you talk about Europe, 
um, there is, it's not monolithic. Sure. There is, it's very different. And then, of course, you have Germany, which has its own history and its own background. So just to give you an idea that this is different, which also means that the experience of Jewish people in Europe is going to be different depending on where in Europe you are. And there's, um, there's three main influences that I see. One is the influence of um, Islamic background immigrants that have come into these countries. Um, and especially with the Syrian civil war, where um, under Germans, Germany's um, yeah, leadership, um, over a million Syrian and also Afga people from Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran and also um, from other parts of the world have come into Europe. And they bring a mindset and they bring a culture and they bring habits, mm -hmm. which is normal. People bring what they're used to yes. uh, with them into the country. And this mindset has been inf influenced by Islam. And Islam, of course, has uh, an indoctrination of hatred against Jews, which it's a bit funny because in a lot of these countries, there's very few people, Jewish people left because they've all fled mm -hmm. because of the persecution. Mm -hmm. But there's kind of an indoctrination that says Jews are to be hated. So this hatred then is imported into the Western European countries. And in Western European countries, we see a, a marked um, rise in violent attacks. Um, and that means, uh, and they come 90%, and it's perhaps sad to admit this, but it's true, 90% is Islamic um, uh, yeah, fueled. So it's Islamic um, backgrounds, Muslim backgrounds, immigrants who were perpetrating these crimes against the Jewish people, not the native Western European people. So it means that in Western Europe, Jewish schools, Jewish synagogues, but even, and this is just mind boggling, even war memorials need police protection. Wow. So, for instance, in my country, I was saying 100,000 people, 104,000 people have been murdered over the war. Of course, we have memorials for this. We have remembrance places where we, we don't want to forget. We want to remember our, 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 our neighbors who have been slaughtered. So these places that are supposed to be held sacred for the memory of these innocent people, even those places are not safe anymore, so they need protection. Well, what kind of a blind hatred is this? Mm -hmm. and so that is what is happening in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. But then Eastern Europe, um, there's less immigrants from Muslim countries in Eastern Europe, partly because, um, well, they've been ruled by Ottoman um, Empire and they have experience of what it means to be overruled by Muslim influence and they they don't want it again they okay. so there is a there they and they don't have the same social network system where people are given things for free as easily as they are in the west so they are attracting less immigrants so the muslim influence in central eastern european countries is absolutely not the same as the west mm -hmm. um, but in these eastern central european countries you have the old um, fascism, the old neo-Nazi sentiments that made places like, for instance, Ukraine famous for collaborating with the SS and um, famous for the atrocities that they did in the war of just not needing a lot of help from the Germans to just march off whole Jewish villages to just, um, you know, act out that same blind hatred that mm -hmm. the Nazis brought in. So that same sentiment is still, sadly, uh, this far-right neo-Nazi um, element is still present in Central and um, Eastern European countries. And so that makes it um, a, a not a very pleasant atmosphere for a Jewish person. If they are honoring the memory of an SS soldier who has murdered thousands of Jews, how would you feel as a Jewish local person? Of course. So that, so that kind of anti-Semitism is there, but funnily enough, it's still safer for a Jew in Central and Eastern Europe because it's rhetoric there, it's ideology, there's no actual attacks. Whereas in the West, the local population would never agree to any neo-Nazi ideology or it's totally, there's no social acceptance for this but there is violence from the Muslim people that are there. And sadly, you only need one crazy person to do a lot of damage. Yes. 
So that are t- those are two kind of um, influences. But then a third one is that the European Union's project has a, a, a kind of a, a, an openness to far left ideology. So one of the expressions of that would be that there is a movement to for, uh, there, a real welcome of the BDS movement. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the BDS movement. Uh, BDS stands for Boycotts, Divert and Sanction. Mm-hmm. And what it really does is it singles out products that have been uh, produced in Israel and particularly in what um, the biblical uh, term of the area would be Judea, Samaria, mm-hmm. but what would be called the contested or disputed territories. And there is a sense that this Israel is um, there on an illegitimate basis. And so all the products that are produced in these areas need to be boycotted to mm-hmm. punish Israel. Mm-hmm. And it, um, it's, it, it, sounds, it sounds kind of like a social justice movement yes. but uh, that cares for poor Palestinians who are being crushed by an evil, so-called evil mm-hmm. Israeli regime. But in reality, there is no real care for the Palestinian populations because these factories that are, are Israeli owned um, are the, the motor of the economy, so to speak, in these mm-hmm. areas. Mm-hmm. It's really where the Palestinian uh, workers find jobs because they are yes. the ones that are being employed there. So if you boycott these factories, you actually bring these Pal- Palestinian workers out of a job. But that is not really uh, considered. It's just uh, creating kind of an atmosphere where Israel is being given a toxic name and where you can foster an atmosphere of anti-feelings and yes. also anti-Semitic feelings. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the European Union is very famous for its push for human rights. In Europe, we're very proud of our human rights um, narrative. We're proud of, um, um, yeah, that's part of our sense of contribution to Western civilization. But these and these human rights are good. We we're happy to celebrate the right to life and the right to all kinds of things that, as yes. in a civilized society, you would wish for all your citizens to have. Um, but these rights um, can also, if they are divorced from a a a, a, a um, um, plumb line of uh, being connected to truth or to absolute reality or to to God then these rights can also go overboard. So then you can have a right to abortion or a right to vacation Mm -hmm. or a right to things that are not necessarily linked to a genuine right or flourishing of human happiness, but it's becoming then quite political. And one of these rights um, uh, is, for instance, uh, the right for the integrity of your body. And so there is a movement in the European Union that sees circumcision as a violation of that right. So under the guise of wanting to protect young uh, Jewish boys because they have no say in being circumcised, there is a a push to now um, have circumcision outlawed. So it sounds nice on paper, but in reality it means that Jewish life is going to be jeopardized. It's it's an anti-Semitic ruling because Mm -hmm. Um, circumcision is essential in Judaism, it's essential in in celebrating the covenant that the Jewish people have with God. So things like that, or for instance, the right of animals to um, have freedom of uh, painful slaughter means that there is now a push against kosher slaughter. And it's really because Islamic slaughter is very cruel for an animal and and the Europeans want to have that eradicated. Um, And then they feel like they cannot make a distinction between kosher slaughter and halal slaughter. So then they all put it in one one box. But practically it means Jewish life is being pushed out. So things like that are happening in Europe that are very worrisome. It's uh, it's scary. (laughs) Well, yes. I mean, how much is how much is going on? All the changes. You know, one of the one of the first things you were discussing. Um, is as immigration is taking place within Europe, different parts of Europe. I just keep coming back to the same problem we're having in the United States. And that is, and, and so here's a question I'm going to pose to you, whether you have the answer or not, I don't know. 
And that would be, is there something we need to change about the immigration process of when a country is bringing in immigrants from a different type of culture, allowing them to retain the important part of their culture? We're, in America, we're the mixing pot, and we're yeah. proud of that. Yeah. But if there isn't a charge to an ethical standard that allows each of us to enjoy our differences and be conformed to a radical, um, the loudest voice gets their way yeah. type of standard, uh, there's a problem. So what, do, you, do you have any ideas of what, what we might do to better the system that we have for immigration? Right. That's such a complicated question, yes. isn't it? Um, I know in Europe, um, in Europe we've talked for a long time about multi the multicultural society, um, and we've tried it. But multicultural society sounds very nice. It's like you like Italian food, I like Chinese food, someone else like Vietnamese, and then there's Mexican, and we all just make our choice based on our taste. Um, and that's the way it's been presented. We can all live together with these different cultural assumptions and cultural norms and it will be fine. But there is a fallacy to that argument because in the end, cultures are based on values and norms. And those values and norms are going to be um, sourced in presuppositions. And these presuppositions, if they are not aligned, they will conflict. So for instance, um, from a Judeo-Christian perspective, we have a very high view of a woman. We see her as someone yes. who is created in God's image. Mm -hmm. um, as a Christian, you would say a woman has the same value as a man because the price on her life, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, was the same for a woman as for yes. a man. Um, and of course, her, um, her gifts and what she brings is different than what a man brings, but her value as a person Mm -hmm. It does not depend on, on, on the power she exerts or, or the, you know, the, 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 the deep, her vo voices. <laughs> it, 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 there is, she brings something special and the yes. man brings something. And they complement each other, but it's not a difference mm -hmm. in value. Whereas some other religious presuppositions do not have that pre the, the assumption. They, and that's, for instance, reflected by the Islamic rule that the testimony of a woman in court is one fourth of that of a man. Or as a man, you can marry four women. So what kind of a power dynamic is that in the marriage? If you have one guy and four women, that's yes. not equal. Yes. So if you bring this kind of mindset to a right. society, there's going to be different outcomes. Yes. And you cannot say, oh, you just pick your taste of Mexican food and I'll go for Italian. No, these are core essential values. Yes that you have to battle out. And Europe has been founded on the Judeo-Christian um, uh, foundation. Mm -hmm. That's what, what that, and that's also what links us with America. And that's also what yes. links us to Israel because mm -hmm. we have similar values. Um, but if you then bring in other values that are in conflict with this, yes. you cannot pretend there's not going to come a clash. Yes. And for instance, for me, the, the biggest example is for instance, um, uh, uh, um, female uh, mutilation yes. or female circumcision. Mm -hmm. um, there is that is an, uh, an abuse of a woman's body. It is mm -hmm. ridiculous. You cannot just say, "Oh, I have no opinion because you used to do this in your culture. It's totally fine to continue doing mm -hmm. this." If you come to my lands where we pride ourselves to giving free or the same uh, level of respect to a woman as to a man then that is not acceptable right. behavior. And right. so then it is right for our societies to stand up for these girls who are being mm -hmm. traumatized for life. Agreed. Um, um, but it takes a certain backbone and it takes a lot of courage to say, these values are better than these values because in the end, that's what you're saying. Yes. And I think in Europe, we have shied away from being upfront about this. I think Americans, as an outsider looking in, I think Americans have been more vocal in saying these are our, our values and this is how we do it. Whereas in Europe, we've been much more kind of wishy-washy, yeah. but it has also created kind of this momentum where now yes. we have a very strong voice that just says, well, we want it differently. 
and the local people are, don't have the ammunition to actually uh -huh. say, you know, actually, this is not how we run our country. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that is one of the main similarities between what's taking place today and what began to take place in the 30s, which led to a horror for the Jewish people and for those who didn't fit the mold of Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. We only have a few minutes left. There's so much we could talk about. What would you like to finish with? What would you like to get across? And please tell people how they can help uh, support what you're doing. Yeah, so we've talked a lot now about the problem and we haven't really talked so much about the solution. But there is a solution. There are a band of Christian people who are standing up for the Jewish state and for the Jewish people in Europe. And our organization is called the European Coalition for Israel. You can look us up on the web, www.ec4i.org. And it will be on the screen as well. Um, and we, um, we talk to decision makers at the European parliaments to bring the situation of the Jewish people to their attention and to also give them an opportunity to learn more so that they can make righteous decisions and help the situation improve. Thank you. We, we have a responsibility. We do. Uh, you feel it passionately in your life. I feel the same in my own life. Uh, we're indebted to the Jewish people uh, for so much in our in our own cultures yeah. and, and our standards of morality, yeah. Judeo-Christian understanding yeah. of how to do life. Yeah. And so we have a we owe them a lot, and standing up for them is the least we can do. Yeah. Dr. Emily Noteboom, thank you so much for being on the show it's this been week. A pleasure. And uh, thank and you. may God bless all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us this week. And uh, as always, we pray the best for you, that you stand firm with what you know is right so that we can all work together and we can change the world for a better place to live as we wait for the Messiah to come. And uh, we thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>